Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the case studies and we shall be looking into the economics of environmental disasters. And one disaster that we want to discuss here is the Love Canal of New York, which ranks in one of the top 10 environmental disasters in the world. The story begins in the year 1894 when William T. Love begins the canal building. The Love Canal is named after this person. William T. Love and the idea was to develop a planned industrial city, a model city of sorts that would be having all the modern facilities. And to bring water to this city, this canal was dug. So this is an old map that is showing us that this is the site of the model city and this was the proposed canal that was being made. In the year 1903, the hooker chemical company was founded and it used to make chloralkali products and it was founded in an area very close to this proposed site. Now this, uh, this uh, factory was developing materials through the chloralkali process which is a process in which uh, the brine solution is uh, electrolyzed to get sodium hydroxide and chlorine. Now in this process Certain other chemicals can also get formed because the brine is not a pure salt in water solution. And so different kinds of compounds can also be formed. At the same time, the industry very soon, because it was profitable, it was very soon expanding into a number of other chemical industries. Now, whenever we have certain chemical processes, there will be certain waste products that will be generated. Because there is a reaction that is going on, there will be certain byproducts. Now, these byproducts need to be treated before they are dumped into the environment. But as in the case of the Minamata disaster, here too, the people who were running this uh, factory, they wanted to go uh, for a cost cutting measure. So, in place of treating the chemicals, they wanted to shift to a process in which they would just uh, postpone the treatment and they would just dump the chemicals somewhere. And by that time, the idea of the planned industrial town that had dropped down. So even though certain portions of the canal had been dug, but the modern industrial town did not come up. So the people who were looking after the waste disposal in the Hooker Chemical Factory they decided that why don't we buy up this land that is already a dug up land and there we can store our chemicals. So that became an idea for the Hooker Chemical Corporation. So whatever waste materials would be produced in this plant, it would be dumped into the canal and it would be dumped in the form of uh, barrels that were full of these chemicals. Now with this thought, the Hooker Chemical Corporation took over the Love Canal. So it took it over in 1942 and for the next 10 years, it used it as a dumping site. Now, after a while, when quite a lot of chemicals had been dumped into this canal, what happened was people started to realize that this land is now soon becoming a liability. Why? Because there are a number of drums that are full of chemicals and these chemicals are also corrosive chemicals so they are eating up the drums from the inside so there is a piece of land that is dug up that is all piled up with chemicals that are there in drums and the chemicals are eating up the drums and so in on any day an accident can come up now, what would have any responsible corporation or any responsible firm done in such a scenario? And they would have 
taken these chemicals out, probably treated them. Because just keeping the toxic materials into dump, uh, in, in the drums at a site is not a solution. It is just a way of postponing things, nothing else. But what this firm did was something very preposterous. They sold this land. So it so happened that in the surrounding, uh, a new colony was coming up and the uh, Hooker Chemical Company sold this piece of land, this canal to the Board of Education. So the Board of Education was looking for a site on which to construct a school and these people said, okay, this is a site that is available, you can have it. And you can have it for just $1. Now what is happening here? If the Board of Education was getting this piece of land for $1, that should have rung a bell. There is something wrong with this site, otherwise why would somebody give it to us for just $1? But then these people again were looking at profit and loss. They took up this land. And if you look at the agreement that was signed, there was a caveat in the agreement. Prior to the delivery of this instrument of conveyance, the grantee herein has been advised, now here the grantee is the Board of Education, has been advised by the grantor, which is the Hooker Chemical Corporation, that the premises above described have been filled in whole or in part to the present grade level thereof with waste products resulting from the manufacturing of chemicals by the grantor at its plant in the city of Niagara Falls, New York. And the grantee assumes all risk and liability incident to the use thereof. All risk and liability incident to the use thereof. So what is happening is that the Board of Education was told that this area is all full of chemical waste, industrial waste. And it is right there on the agreement. And by this sale deed, the Hooker Chemical Corporation is giving up all the rights and all the liabilities on this land for $1. And the Board of Education is happily accepting it. It is therefore understood and agreed that as a part of the consideration for this convenience and as a condition thereof, no claim, suit, action or demand of any nature whatsoever shall ever be made by the grantee, its successors or assigns against the grantor, its successors or assigns for injury to a person or persons including death resulting thereof or the loss of or damage to property caused by in connection with or by reason of the presence of the said industrial waste. It is further agreed as a condition hereof that each subsequent conveyance of the aforesaid lands shall be made subject to the foregoing provisions and conditions. So this agreement is clearly stating that there are industrial waste on this land and these waste can result in uh, injury, even death of people or damage to property and when this agreement is being signed, so it is being signed on the condition that the Board of Education now assumes all the liabilities and at the same time, there will not be any suit whatsoever against the Hooker Chemical Corporation by the Board of Education or by anybody to whom the Board of Education assigns this land. And if the Board of Education later on wants to have an agreement with anybody else, then this condition has to be mentioned there. That there will not be any uh, suit against the Hooker Chemical Corporation. Now here we are observing that for one, the Hooker Chemical Corporation is trying to give away its liabilities, whereas the responsible course of action would have been to treat those chemicals. So it has dumped those chemicals, but it has never treated them. Then when it is giving this land to the Board of Education, at least the Board of Education should have been more careful. And especially when it is being written on the agreement. Now the thing is, many people just do not read the agreements when they are signing them. And this is exactly what is happening here. 
and when we are talking about things which is industrial based that can uh, lead to death then this is not something that should be taken lightly but this is exactly what was done then so this is the caveat in the agreement and later on what happened schools and houses were constructed on this land and here you can notice this white residue that is coming up so in this aerial photograph we can observe that this is the site on which the canal was there so you can see the site here so this was the site and on this site now people have constructed houses people have constructed uh, a school and there is also white residue that is coming up now in the beginning people do not care much about any residue so if you go and purchase any new property you will just think that okay things are fine this is just the color of the land but then soon enough people started to notice a number of other things so in their re uh, residences people started to observe that wherever there was a, a basement some black colored toxic residue was coming in and this residue was smelling like anything so it was smelling like industrial waste and it was seeping in and whenever they tried to clean it up the next day again this residue came in so there was no relief from this industrial residue and it was getting inside the homes and now when the residue is getting inside the homes it means that people are now directly getting exposed to these chemicals these waste then people started to observe that uh, on certain pieces of land holes started to appear with chemical spelling black liquids now why do we have a hole because remember that these chemicals were dumped in drums and these chemicals were often corrosive so they were starting to eat up the the drum from inside and whenever they get a leak the chemicals would get out of the drum but what happens then so you have a drum and this drum is full of a toxic industrial waste and this is corroding so when it corrodes there will be certain holes that get developed on the body of the drum when that happens all this chemical it seeps out so now the chemical is outside and inside the area is now vacant now when you have such a situation so you have a drum that is empty and this empty drum is beneath a layer of soil which is exerting pressure now once that happens the drum might collapse and when it collapses we start to observe such kinds of holes but then the residents who were taking up the properties in this brand new location they did not know that there is this chemical deep inside so holes start to appear toxic residues they start to rise so here you can observe that on the ground we are observing different kinds of residues different colors black sludge is coming on the ground so people are directly getting exposed to all of these waste barrels are rising to the surface so here you can observe a barrel that has come to the surface now why is it coming to the surface because again when you have these chemicals inside and when these chemicals are getting leaked out then these chemicals can react amongst themselves once that happens in a number of cases certain gases can be produced and gases because they have a larger volume so they start to exert a pressure once they start to exert a pressure the drum would slowly rise to the surface because it is getting pushed from beneath and this is what we are observing waste barrels start rising to the surface so here are the waste barrels that you can observe that have come up to the surface and so this is again a collapsed barrel head and toxic waste residues that has risen to the surface 
and once all of this is happening then people start to protest so love canal homeowners association protest targeting the federal government held outside uh, the niagara falls new york department of health building so now people are starting to agitate they are asking what is this residue that is coming into our homes they are asking that okay the site where this school is constructed all these uh, drums are coming to the surface and the uh, pupils are playing with these drums they are playing with these chemicals now if there are these industrial chemicals or this these chemicals that have such strange smells and our children are playing with these chemicals won't they have a negative impact and if there is a negative impact what is the government doing so this is what they are asking now and when such a thing happens the government did an environmental sampling so an environmental sampling was done in all of this area and this is the result the kinds of chemicals that were identified benzene which leads to things like narcosis and skin irritation so this is acute effect acute effect is something that happens quickly so for any of these compounds we have certain acute effects which happen uh, in a short period of time and we have certain chronic effects that happen over a long period of time so if you have this chemical the acute effects and the chronic effects for most of the chemicals they are already known so when this environmental sampling was done then if any chemical was found so people can now know what will be the impacts so let us look at the impacts acute leukemia which is blood cancer aplastic anemia which is again another blood disorder pancytopenia chronic lymphatic leukemia lymphomas anemia leukopenia that is all these different kinds of blood disorders are cropping up paralysis respiratory and cardiac arrest visual defects deafness respiratory distress death liver tumors so we are observing that all these different kinds of chemicals like benzene toluene benzoic acid lindane trichloroethylene all of these are now be found in this area and there are certain acute effects like narcosis irritation or liver damage allergy anesthesia but there are also these chronic effects a lot of which are cancers so we are observing that these chemicals over the long term can result in cancers they can result in things like blood disorders or they can result in paralysis or they can result in uh, neurological disorders so we are observing all different kinds of disorders because of these chemicals now if you are living in an area that is having these chemicals and the government has done a study and found out that these chemicals are actually in that area what will you do people started to get panic people started to agitate a lot and in this case the health impacts also told that the relative odds ratio for miscarriages among women living on the canal was 1.49 or nearly 1 and 1/2 times the expected rate within the general population that is these sorts of uh, health uh, damages they were not just theoretical people were actually observing that the rate of miscarriage or abortions in this area was a lot higher in that in the general population so the situation was pretty alarming the hooker chemical corporation started to uh, do a propaganda war they started to say that no we are not the culprits we are the people who actually built this area we are the people who provide jobs to people in this area and so on but still they are not telling the people they are not coming out and telling that okay so and so waste are there in the cdr it is for the investigators to find out what is there inside but what the government did was to make a remediation plan now what was this remediation plan so there was this love canal that was all filled up 
with the chemicals so the remediation plan was to cover it up with a top layer of soil so that water does not seep in so whenever there is a rain and if water seeps in then the chemicals find it much more easy to come out so one step in remediation was to cover it with a layer of top soil so that water does not get inside and any water that falls it should get out of these channels then there were these canals dug so that the residues that were getting into the basement they get an area to move out so these trenches were dug and in these trenches the idea was that the chemicals would that were seeping into the basement they would get into these trenches and they would slowly flow out and there they would be collected and perhaps treated so this was the remediation plan that was made and also the waste barrels that people could find out they were removed from this area so this is a barrel and you can look at the scale of the operation so many barrels of toxic waste that are there in the canal they are now being removed but people are still panicking so the residents start to evacuate so this is a family that is picking their belongings uh, to evacuate to a safer housing houses get abandoned so this new colony that was set up in this area that was having a prime a property or a prime location now it is getting abandoned the house rates fall like anything and the residents are moving away the school that was built that was demolished and the remediation work it involved a lot of earth moving digging of holes and removing the chemicals but still even today it is a long standing problem why because we still have a large number of waste barrels that are still there in the neighborhood they are still corroding the area they are still uh, influencing the surroundings we still have that smell in the area now the thing to remember here is that if the hooker chemical corporation had decided to go with the the well set plan that whenever you have a chemical waste you should not release it into the environment you should treat it if they had followed that principle then none of this would have occurred but because this treatment involves an externality if they dumped these waste and if they came up with an agreement that we are not responsible for any of these the person who is buying this takes all the responsibility and these kinds of loopholes permit people to go on polluting and when these chemicals get released the negative impacts are faced by the whole of the society with very tragic consequences so this is something that we need to keep in mind that these kinds of environmental disasters occur because there are certain corporations that are providing jobs to people so this is what hooker corporation also said in the propaganda war that if we were not here you people would not be having the jobs if we were not here you would not be having this uh, this new society in the first place there would not be prosperity in this area but then when we talk about things like prosperity when we talk about things like employment it does not mean that people should be Are ready to take up employment even at the cost of their health that is to say if there is a development that is happening in terms of higher incomes or in terms of employment or higher standards of living then we cannot say that this development will be done without any thought about the costs that are involved because in a number of cases in the short term people would only look at okay we are getting employment we are getting a higher job we are getting a job in this factory but then in the long term the consequences are felt by them by them themselves or by their children and in a large number of cases we have observed 
that whenever there is a corporation that knowingly or unknowingly pollutes the environment there are human costs also involved so while the corporations are giving prosperity they are also giving a lot of human costs they are also giving a number of diseases they are also giving a large number of deaths and it is as a society that we need to understand and we need to decide what we want are we only looking at the short term or are we also serious about what will be the impacts for our children and our grandchildren because whenever anything wrong happens in this case as well whenever uh, as soon as the the residents got to know that there are industrial chemicals they started to protest against the government why doesn't the government do anything why doesn't the government give us a compensation why do, why doesn't the government evacuate us so in the last resort we will will all, always go to the government but then the corporations also have to be made responsible for their actions only then will the corporations stop doing such kinds of environmental damages so this is a very important learning from the issue of love canal another case is the delhi smog every year in the winter months our national capital suffers from a very huge amount of pollution that results in a smog smog is a term that refers to smoke plus fog this is the smog so when we talk about the delhi smog it is a situation where we have a huge amount of smoke and foggy conditions because of which that smoke gets uh, attached to the fog particles and that results in a heavy amount of pollution so any year if you go to delhi in the winter months you will find a situation like this so there is a smoke everywhere and the conditions are foggy you do not have a very good amount of visibility you cannot look far up and the media has been calling it things like a gas chamber and the government has also been doing something about it like distribution of masks to uh, students so that they do not suffer from the negative health impacts of this smog but the question is what are the reasons for this smog this smog is a big environmental disaster the environment is not good the environment sometimes is dangerously toxic people are suffering from health impacts from running nose running eyes allergies cough asthma to even things like heart diseases that are resulting because of this huge amount of pollution the governments are very concerned about this but the thing is if you want to stop a pollution you at least need to know what is causing this pollution now when we talk about the delhi smog when we talk about the delhi winters it is important to know what are the conditions like what are the weather conditions like why do we only get this smog in the winter seasons why don't we get it in the other seasons because if we talk about the sources of pollution things like cars so cars and other vehicles they are flying throughout the year so why don't we get this condition in the summer season what is so special about the winters if we talk about things like uh, thermal power stations they are working all the time if we talk about things like construction activities burning of waste it is happening at all times why do we get a smog only in the winter season so if you look at the weather profile we'll find that the maximum and the minimum temperatures are like this so here we are observing from 1st of october to 14th of november and in this period the maximum and the minimum temperatures they are going down which means that this is now the beginning of the winter season and in this period the precipitation on the rainfall is zero which means that if there are any pollutants in the air there is no rain to wash them down if there was any rain in this period 
then probably the amount of pollutants would have gone down because the rain would have brought them down from the air to the ground. But what we are observing is that in these months, there is absolutely no rainfall. Or even when we get rainfall, it is so small that it does not play a big role. But the temperatures are down and the relative humidity is very high. So in the morning, the relative humidity is close to 100%. Now, if this relative humidity touched 100%, then we would have a rainfall. But here, the relative humidity is very close to 100%, but it's not touching 100%. So we are not getting rains. But when the relative humidity is close to 100%, it would mean that it will be very easy to generate a fog. Now, what is a fog? In the case of a fog, the water that is present in the form of water vapor in the air, it gets condensed on the smoke particles or on the dust particles and becomes very small water droplets. Now, these droplets, when they are suspended in the air, they behave very much like a cloud and they reduce the visibility. So that is a fog. And in the morning time, the relative humidity is so high that it generates a very good condition for a fog. In the afternoon, the relative humidity goes down, but still it is close to or above 50%, which means that the fog will not dissipate very quickly. In these seasons, if, it, uh, if the air heated up, so then the water droplets that had condensed on the dust particles, they would again evaporate back. But then, because of the low temperatures, we are not seeing that condition. So the relative humidity decreases, but it de does not decrease sufficiently enough, probably because uh, of the cold conditions. Then if we look at the wind speed, now wind plays a very important role because if there is wind, then it would probably take the pollutants away from the area. So if there is an industry, and this industry is giving out smoke. And if there is a wind movement, then what will happen is that this smoke will move to far away areas. So it gets diluted. But if you look at the wind conditions, we'll find that the wind speed is also progressively decreasing. So the wind speed was close to four or four and a half kilometer per hour in the beginning of October, but by the middle of November, it is now less than one kilometer per hour. So now there is no wind to take the pollutants away. And in these conditions, we observe a phenomenon that is known as temperature inversion. Temperature inversion. Now, what does that mean? In the normal circumstances, the air near the ground is hotter than the air that is upwards. That is, as we move from the ground level to higher altitudes, the temperature goes on decreasing. Now, that is the normal temperature profile that we observe. That is, if we look at a vertical profile, if this is the ground level, so here the temperature is high. And at a location that is upwards, the temperature is low. Now, this has a very important role in our normal climatic functions. Because at higher temperatures, the air is less denser, which means that the hot air tries to move up. And when it moves up, because in this case, the air above that is denser, the air below is lighter. So this air tries to move up and somewhere this air will try to go down. So in the normal circumstances, the air is moving from the ground to the upwards locations. But what happens in the case of tem temperature inversion is that we have a situation that is opposite to that. So in the normal circumstances, below is hot, above is cold. 
and so the hot air rises and takes the pollutants away. So if we have this industry, the smoke is going up. In the case of a temperature inversion, what happens is that the above air is hot and the below air is cold. Now the cold air being denser, it does not rise. And so any pollutants that get released, they get trapped in these lower layers. So essentially the upper layers of air, which are hotter, they are acting as a lid on the top. So any pollutants that come up in the bottom layer, they will get entrapped here. Now, why do we have such a situation? This is happening because in the normal circumstances, the sun would have been heating up the ground. So the sunlight is able to pass the air and when it reaches to the ground, then it heats up the ground because it gets absorbed by the ground surface. So what happens is that in the normal circumstance, we have the sun and we have this ground layer and the heat of the sun is able to heat up this ground layer. So this gets heated up. When this ground layer is heated up, it means that the air that is surrounding this area is also heated up. So now the temperature of air in this area is high. Whereas if you look at a point above, then because the sun rays are able to cross or pass through the atmosphere, so it does not heat up the atmosphere that much. So in these upper locations, the temperature is low. So this is a normal circumstance. The ground gets heated up, heating up the air that comes in contact and the air that is uh, on the top is colder. And so this warm air continues to rise. In the case of temperature inversion, what happens is that in this winter months, the sun is farther from this location. And so this ground is not getting heated up that fast. And so the bottom layer is now not that heated up. So the heating up is now not happening. Once that happens, and because you have a great amount of smog or you have clouds which are preventing the light of the or the heat of the sun to reach to the ground, what happens is that the ground does not get heated up that fast. And once the ground gets cooled up and it is not getting heated because of the sun, so now we have a situation when the ground layer is colder. So this area is now colder. Colder means that the surrounding air will also have a lower temperature. But the air that was there on the top, that is now relatively warmer. So what is happening is that the air on the top is not getting heated up in the case of a temperature inversion. But what is happening is that the ground is not getting heated up, which means that the ground is getting very cold. And due to that, the air that is surrounding the ground that is also getting cooler. Now in such a circumstance, we have a condition where any pollutants that are released, they will get trapped. Here. And if you look at the level of pollutants in Delhi, in this period, this is what we see. So on the right, we have the air quality index. So we move from good to satisfactory to moderately polluted to poor, to very poor, to severe. And this is air quality index, some indices for these different factors of pollutants. So PM10 is particulate matter that is of a larger size. PM2.5 is particulate matter that is less than 2.5 microns. And we have nitrogen dioxide and we have carbon monoxide. And if you look at the PM10 level, we will find that the PM10 level is this line and it is now getting very close to very high values which is entering into the severe conditions. If you look at PM2.5 that is even larger and in certain portions of the month that is after say 7th of November it has already reached to a level that is having severe health consequences. 
Now the question is why do we have these conditions? Why do we see this peak? Why do we see this peak? What is causing these pollution? So to understand that, we can look at different pollutants in a differential manner. Now, why is that important? This is important because different pollutants have different sources. So if nitrogen oxides are getting up in the air, it means that the vehicles are the primary cause of pollution. Why? Because nitrogen dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxides get released during the process of internal combustion that is happening in the vehicles. Whereas if the sulfur dioxide levels go up, it means that the majority of pollution is happening because of the role of thermal power plants which are burning coal because coal has sulfur inside and so when coal is burnt it also releases sulfur if you look at vehicular exhaust it has a very minimal amount of sulfur and so by looking at nitrogen oxides versus sulfur oxides we can make a correlation whether vehicles are more important uh, in this pollution or whether the stationary sources like uh, thermal power plants, they are more important. So now we will look at each and every pollutant in a differential manner. So the first pollutant that we are observing is ammonia. Now this curve is showing the amount of ammonia or the concentration of ammonia with reference to the percentage of October beginning. So if in the beginning of October we take that the percentage is 100%, how does it shift throughout these months of October and November? So it moves from close to 100% and it is roughly stable till around uh, 20 October. But after that, it, it starts to increase and then it reaches to a maximum at around say 7th or 8th of November. Now, what releases ammonia? If you look at the sources of ammonia, we will find that the major source is animal manure, followed by mineral fertilizers, especially the nitrogenous fertilizers, followed by this one, 13 is biomass burning, followed by things like crops and their decomposition, human waste, soils under natural vegetation. So the common thing that you'll notice here is that ammonia is released from biological sources. Things like animal manure, burning of crops, burning of residues, human waste. So all of these are organic substances. And if you look at animal manure, now there will hardly be a change in the amount of animal manure that is being generated in different months. Because it is not that in the months of October and November, we get uh, animals from different areas that come to Delhi and so the amount of animal manure goes up. That is not the situation. Similarly, if we look at mineral fertilizers, so yes, some amount of fertilizers are added, but then if we look at this time, this is the, the time around Diwali and around Diwali, there are no new crops that are being sown. So fertilizer application can also not be a reason why this ammonia is being generated in a large amount. Soils under natural vegetation or human based or crops and their decomposition, they are again not very important sources. They are important sources, but they are not that important because there will not be a major change in these factors in the months of October and November as compared to in the other seasons. Now, of course, because we are having a condition of temperature inversion, so any ammonia that is released into the air that gets trapped. And so the, it will play a role in increasing the concentrations. But then one important factor here is biomass burning, which is shown here in pink. And where do we get biomass burning? Well, this is a satellite image that is telling us where we were observing signs of burning or fire signatures on 15th of October. Now here we can observe that in major parts of Punjab, Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh, we are seeing a very large fire signature. Now this is because in those areas, 
people once they have harvested the crops and most of the harvesting is being done through machines these days so whatever stubble remains that is burnt in preparation for the next agricultural season now the question is why would somebody burn these stubble early days what people used to do is that they would bring the animals onto the field animals especially goats goats and sheep they used to be brought into the fields and they used to eat up all the stubble and the manure that they used to release that also used to act as a fertilizer for the next crop but that was being done when the fertilizers were or the chemical fertilizers were not available or they were very expensive these days because of advances in technology advances in industrial production we have reduced the cost of fertilizers especially things like urea and so now it is much more cost efficient to just purchase the fertilizers and put them into the field so now the uh, goats and the sheep they are not being used to that end, that large an extent at the same time when in the early days people used to harvest their crops they used to do it with sickles and when the crops are cut using sickles the amount of stubble that is generated is very small but with harvesters the amount of stubble is also very large now in a field that has very small size of stubble something like this it is difficult to burn this field because the fire will not spread from point a to point b but what is happening now is that with the harvesters the size of the stubble is very large and so if the farmer puts this portion on fire the fire is very able very easily able to reach the other areas of the field and so now it is much more cheaper much more effective to just burn the field and this is what we are observing in these satellite fire signatures in these areas of punjab haryana and western up we see a major fire signature that is not being seen in the other areas primarily because in the other areas our agriculture is not that mechanized people are not using harvesters to that large an extent and so it is much cheaper to just cut these stubble and use them as hay in the other areas and this fire signature continues so this is 15th of october this is 25th of october here again punjab haryana and western uttar pradesh you see a major fire signature in other areas as well we are now starting to see the fire signatures as more and more agriculture is getting mechanized but even today primarily it is punjab and haryana and western uttar pradesh where this crop field burning is happening this is 4th of november again punjab and haryana are burning this is 10th of november now in all this period the majority of the wind is coming from the north western direction that is this direction which means that if punjab and haryana are burning and we are getting winds in this direction it shows that all of this smoke can reach to our national capital of delhi so we have observed two things one is that the ammonia level is going up which is telling us that there could be biomass burning we are observing biomass burning in the satellite imagery and the wind conditions are such in, especially in the beginning of october that we are able to bring this smoke to delhi now the wind direction is from the northwest to the southeast but the wind speed is very low which means that the wind will bring this pollutant or all this smoke but it is not a fast enough wind to carry this away to larger areas so it is now getting accumulated and because of temperature inversion there is also no chance of this pollutant getting higher up in into the atmosphere and getting lost and so it gets on accumulating in the air so this is one reason let us now look at another pollutant nitrogen dioxide now this is again percentage of october beginning so it goes on increasing 
Now, if we look at sources of nitrogen dioxide, we will find that the majority is the mobile sources. And these mobile sources are the vehicles. Now, what happens in the case of petrol or diesel vehicles is that we have internal combustion engines in which petrol and diesel are burnt at very high temperatures. Now, why do they play a role? Well, our air is more than 70% nitrogen. And at very high temperatures that are there inside these internal combustion engines, this nitrogen can react with oxygen and give out nitrogen oxides. Now, that high a temperature is not there in most of the other fire sources. And so our kitchen fires or normal fires will not generate that much amount of nitrogen oxide as will be generated by these internal combustion engines. And so the mobile sources are the largest sources of nitrogen oxides. Now in this period from October to November, it is not that the number of vehicles are going up every year. It is not that we are bringing vehicles from other areas into Delhi so that we can have more of nitrogen oxide. But what is happening is that because of the temperature inversion, any amount of nitrogen oxides that are given out by these vehicles, they will remain trapped in the Delhi air. And so even though the numbers are not increasing, but because the nitrogen oxides are not getting out, so the concentration increases. So vehicles also play a role. Next, let us have a look at sulfur dioxide. Now, here again, sulfur dioxide goes on increasing. We see a very sharp increase around uh, 21st of October. And after that, it goes down, but then it remains high. If you look at the sources of sulfur dioxide, the largest sources are electricity generation and industry. And if you look at the mobile sources, they are very small sources. This is because when uh, coal is burnt for electricity generation in thermal power plants, the sulfur that is there present in, in the coal, that also gets burnt and becomes sulfur dioxide. Also in a number of uh, chemical reactions that occur in industrial processes, sulfur dioxide is released. But then the amount of sulfur that we have in petrol or diesel is already very low. And so vehicles do not form a major chunk of the release of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. So these are the major sources. So now what we are observing with this is that the electricity generation or the industries in Delhi and surrounding areas are also playing a role in the Delhi smog. But then how do we explain this huge rise around 20th? Well, this is because we had the festival of Diwali here. So during the festival of Diwali, people burn crackers, people burn fireworks, and sulfur is a very important component of the explosives that are used in these crackers. So when these crackers are burned, sulfur dioxide gets released. And this is, this is one explanation that can tell us why during this period we saw this heavy rise in the concentration of sulfur dioxide. And once this concentration has increased, then it remains high for the rest of the period. Which means that the cracker burning is also playing a role. So different components are playing a role. We saw the role of biomass burning, we saw the role of uh, automobiles, we saw the role of industries, we saw the role of the crackers. If you look at other substances like carbon monoxide, so the concentration increases, it roughly becomes double from the beginning of October. Now here again, it is not that more and more of incomplete combustion is happening in this period. But what is actually happening is that because of temperature inversion, the carbon monoxide that has been generated is not able to move out. But this is also telling us that a lot of incomplete combustion is happening. And quite a lot of incomplete gen uh, combustion also happens when the municipal wastes are burned. So if there is a fall of leaves and if people just 
burn that, then that would also release a lot of these chemicals that would release ammonia, that would release carbon monoxide. And when we look at all of these chemicals together, then we also have a lot of reactions that happen. That is, when we have ammonia that is high and when we have sulfur dioxide that is high, we can have the formation of ammonium sulfate in the atmosphere or in the air. Now this ammonium sulfate will be in the form of a particle. And this is what we are observing here, that the concentration of PM10 and PM2.5 is going up. This is because of a large number of uh, photoreactions that happen when you have these huge concentrations of pollutants in the air. So because of these chemicals uh, or these chemical reactions, we have the formation of a large number of particles. Many of these particles are also getting released into the atmosphere because of things like construction activities. So whenever there is a construction activity, there will be a lot of dust that gets released. A lot of dust also comes up in the form of the smoke particles in the vehicles or whenever uh, the waste is burned. Or a lot of it is also coming from the agricultural waste that people in Punjab and Haryana are burning and the wind is bringing them on to Delhi. So what we are observing is that there is not one source of the pollution in Delhi or the smog in Delhi. There are a large number of sources and these sources include primarily the changed weather conditions because of temperature inversion the pollutants get trapped. They have nowhere else to go and so, if people were more sensitive, they would try to stop the any release of pollutant whatsoever in these months because in these months, if any pollutant is released, it will not go anywhere away. It will just remain there in Delhi. So, if you wanted to bring these pollutants down, you will have to act on all of these sources. We cannot just say that, yes, vehicles are the culprit, so vehicles should be banned or that only the agricultural waste burning is a culprit, so that should be banned. Or that industries are a culprit and industries should be banned. No. This is a cumulative effect of all of these different sources that are acting together. And so everything needs to be done in moderation. All sources of pollution have to be brought down because the uh, weather conditions are such that the pollutants will not go away. But then a large fraction is also being generated by the agricultural waste, the, uh, uh, the thermal power plants and industries and the automobiles. So they will also have to be toned down. So to sum up, there are certain environmental disasters that are easy to explain because they are the result of the greed or the procrastination of a few actors such as the Love Canal tragedy. If the Hooker Chemical Corporation had treated the waste before dumping, this disaster would not have happened. If the Hooker Waste Corporation had decided that before giving up this land to the education board or for the construction of uh, buildings nearby, they would have treated the waste, then this disaster would not have happened. If the people who bought this land the Board of Education, if they had looked into the agreement that they were signing and had taken an action, this disaster would not have happened. But in this case, the consequences were faced by so many people who lost their homes, who had to suffer from bad health. Now, in certain other environmental disasters, such as the Delhi smog, there are roles of a large number of factors, from weather, to things like agricultural waste burning, to vehicles, to electricity generation, industries and so on. Now, in such disasters that are a result of a large number of players that are all contributing to the disaster, it becomes more of a social responsibility together with an individual responsibility to curtail these sources of pollution. Because after all, when, whenever we release these pollutants into the air, 
it is we ourselves and our children and our grandchildren that will have to suffer the consequences and so it is in our own interest to become more environmentally friendly environmentally conscious so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind